Hello everybody, welcome to another C++ tutorial. So today I just want to start putting a few of the things that we've been through together. Uh, we're going to make a little game. But I wanted to first mention that something that I think about anyway, and that's that, that coding is really, really easy, but programming something is not. And I just mean that it's easy to know what C out does, or, you know, int i equals 3. It's easy to know things like that, but um, sort of knowing how to put the things together and uh, actually make something, you know, actually make a complete application is, is extremely difficult. And uh, it just takes practice. So you've really got to sit down and, uh, yeah, practice, practice, practice. It's fun practicing, but it is, you know, it takes a long time. So on that note, let's make video games. Okay, this is the best way to practice. Best way I know of, anyway. Uh, so the game that we're going to make is fairly basic. Uh, it does show, however, the exact same patterns that you'll see even in the biggest budget games, your World of Warcraft or your, you know, Need for Speeds or whatever game, really. The biggest games in the world use exactly what, you know, the same patterns as we're going to go through. So, uh, programming games and programming applications is basically the same thing, strangely enough. Uh, an application is just a game with a really boring objective. Yeah, kind of. Uh, anyway, games are all the same. So this is the basic game loop. Um, we get input from the player. That's sort of read the keyboard or, or read where the mouse is or read the controller. Uh, then we update the world, which means that we um, figure out what all the enemy AIs are supposed to be doing, the NPCs or non-player characters. And, you know, we help all the blocks to fall down if they're in mid-air or we do the physics. Uh, then we draw the graphics and we repeat those three steps over and over again. So there's another couple of things you might want to do. Maybe you've got sound in your game, you might do that in the update world part, or maybe you'll do it after draw graphics. But basically, from a really broad point of view, those three steps are in just about every game. And they're almost always in that order as well. Uh, but you can change the order, so there's no real hard and fast rules. And um, the game that we're going to make at the end, I've actually changed that order a little bit. But um, usually you wouldn't. Usually that's the order that you want to stick to. But uh, whatever works for you. Really? Yeah, these aren't hard and fast rules. They're just um, just ideas to help people sort of stru structure uh, projects and programming. Yeah, so the game that we're going to look at, actually I've swapped the enemy AI and the user input around. It just made sense that way, but we'll get to that. Um, okay, so the game that we're working on today, it's not... You know, no graphics or anything, it's just a console, but it's a good game. And uh, it's going to be, uh, the computer will ask you to guess a number between 0 and 100, and then it's going to try and guess which number you're thinking of, and you have to tell it higher or lower. Alrighty, so that's kind of why I had to swap the enemy AI and player input around. It's sort of like um, the computer is playing a game with you, sort of thing. Yeah, that's a bit weird, but that's kind of what's happening. Uh, anyway, I'll post the, uh, the source code to this to the website so you can have a look uh, without typing it all out. Uh, it's probably not bad practice to type it out anyway, uh, if you like, just because it's good to get used to sort of typing IO stream and C out and, you know, main, and it's good to get used to typing the, the syntax to C++. It just helps speed things up. Okay, so we're just going to start going through it, really. Uh, the variables in the game... Well, first off, I've got to include IO stream and using namespace STD. But then I've got, what's that, six variables in the game. And I've actually put these outside of any function, so they're global variables. They're available to every function. And normally, normally you don't have all of your variables uh, global in a game. You know, people think that's a big no-no. But um, for this particular game, it's really, really small, and I just wanted all of the variables to be visible from my functions. So this, I think, is a good way to do it. Yeah. We're actually just using a single file here, so it doesn't actually matter. Um, the bigger games, though, if you make everything global, you're going to run into trouble. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the main function, this is actually at the end of the file, you'll see in the source code, but the main function, as we know, that's where um, Windows starts running our program. And basically, all we want to do here is present a little menu. And if the user quits from that menu, then it's going to come down here to return zero and quit the game. Uh, otherwise, if they say they want to play the game, then it goes into the main game loop. It's just there. That while play game. Um, that's going to continuously call the play game function. 
can't remember if we did functions or not. Yeah, that's going to continuously call them the play game function. Yeah, until the play game function returns, you know, that we want to go back to the main menu. But um, the outlying structure of a game is a web of control screens. Yeah, this is really, really important, actually. So all of the screens lead back and forth between one another uh, for things like settings and main menu, save and load game. Uh, these screens are actually um, not the main playable part of the screen. And, you know, most users would, would probably just forget about them, you know, navigate through the screens and, and try and get to, to play the game. But these screens are also extremely important. And uh, if you make your whole game without implementing sort of I don't know, a little splash screen at the start or, or a menu to ask where the user wants to go. Um, you'll find that it's actually quite hard to, to add these screens afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's the uh, main menu just there. So this is the first thing that comes up. It just says, welcome to the game. And then I've got one of those infinite loops, but we know that it's not infinite because there's a bunch of returns down here that actually break out of the loop. Um, yeah, we present a little menu, one for play or two for exit. And playing the game. Okay, so once they say that they want to play the game, it comes to this. And this is the main playing the game loop. Um, shows a story, then it resets the game. And then we've got the actual uh, main play loop or the main game loop here. So this, this you know, play game is, is uh, sort of the main game function. But the actual game's loop that repeats over and over again is right here. So we see update world, draw graphics, get input. Update world, draw graphics, get input. Update world, draw graphics, get input. I'm sure you can see the pattern. Uh, until the user hits Y, which means that they want to quit. Fair enough. And when they quit, we show them the game over screen. And uh, that's pretty much how the main game loop works. Yeah, usually you'd have get input at the top. And then you'd uh, update world, then draw graphics. But as we went through before, I want to... Um, yeah, do things a little differently. Put get input last. Okay, so the story. I've not actually made a story for this game. I mean, there's no real story going on, but this is just another one of those sort of spacing out screens that you want to put in certain places. So the structure of your game is really important as well. Uh, there's a lot more than to a game than just that game loop, and you'll often need things like do you really want to quit the game screens or maybe a HUD. Uh, heads up display, uh, maybe you need a setting screen, and all of those screens, you know, they should be added at some early stage, not at the end. You should sort of think about which ones um, you think you're going to need and add them at the start. You don't have to finish them, just add kind of basic screens, like this kind of thing, pretty much. I thought maybe there would be a story in my game eventually, so I made this little story screen. Um, okay, so resetting the game happens straight after the story, and all you want to do here is basically uh, restart the game, you know. Um, all I've done here is actually made the uh, AI um, set itself back to the default, which is, um, you know, the lower bound of zero and the upper bound of uh, difficulty, which is 100 plus 1, and reset the user's input to N. Yeah, that's pretty basic. Um, okay, so updating the world, controlling the enemy AI. Okay, you're versing the computer in this game. I suppose you're probably trying to think of um, a really difficult number for it to guess, but, you know, it's going to guess it anyway. Um, this is pretty basic as well. We've pretty much got uh, my guess equals lower bound plus upper bound over 2, and that's actually going to keep getting closer and closer to the number that you're thinking. Uh, so long as you're honest when you tell the computer if it's higher or lower. If you lie, uh, it's going to know that you cheated. And uh, it knows that when its last guess equals its current guess. Yeah, it says you cheated and quits. Yeah, fair enough. So this AI here, you might sort of look at that and say, well, that's not artificial intelligence. You know, that's not AI. That's just a stupid trick. But um, that's exactly what AI is. It, it's a trick. Yeah, the computer can't think. It's all tricks like this. So this little algorithm just here will make the computer seem like it's trying to guess your number, uh, even though it's not. You know, it couldn't care less what number you're thinking of. But um, it seems like it's trying to guess a number. Yeah, that's a trick to AI. It's a good topic. Anyway, uh, drawing the graphics. So this is pretty basic, really. We've got no graphics in this game, but I used the drawing the graphics part of the loop just to print out a little menu. So the computer says, I think, and then it tells you what number it's thinking, and then you get a choice to type 
L for lower or H for higher or Y for yes, you guessed the number. Uh, reading user input is pretty basic as well. We just read a, a, a character from the user. That's the L, the H or the Y that we had on that previous screen. And then we act accordingly. So if they type L, then we update the upper bound. If they type H, we update the lower bound. Uh, otherwise, if they type yes, then the computer has guessed what your number is and he's, uh, he's happy. Um, yeah, this is an extremely important function. So this is a really uh, common use of switch as well, um, to put it in the um, function that acts on the user's input. So here we get something from the uh, keyboard and we use switch to do the, uh, you know, deal with the different options that could possibly be typed in. And the game over screen. So this is another one of those sort of screens that just spaces everything out nicely, makes it feel a bit more professional. You know, you don't want to jump straight from um, the player dying to the main menu. You want to kind of have something in between there that says, you know, you did really well. You're a really good player. Please play again. Uh, otherwise, players feel a bit sad and they quit and they go and do something, you know, outside. But uh, this screen happens when the number you've... Uh, you know, when the computer has guessed your number. And that's about it. So I'll put the source up on my website, and uh, you needn't type it out. But the game's paced okay, I guess. Uh, it could be a bit better, but um, I don't know. It's pretty good for a little game. Maybe 120 lines of code or so. And the AI, I think, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think uh, that's about the fastest algorithm you can possibly get a computer, you know, to play this particular game. If you, if you change the difficulty variable at the top of the code, uh, you can make the game easier or harder. So you could make it guess from, you know, zero to a million if you wanted. And uh, I can pretty much guarantee that if you change that up to something like 10 million, um, the computer will always guess the number quicker than a human would. Yeah, if you play the same game, you know, with the same number, if you play the same number with a human and with a computer, I think the computer will get there faster. Anyway, make games. They're really fun and they're an excellent way to push yourself and learn programming. So before we go, I just wanted to play that little game. Uh, here it is here. If I just sort of slowly scroll through so that maybe um, if you don't go to the website and download it, maybe you can um, type it out from here. Yeah, so that's it. It's just the um, code that we went through in the slides. And this is what it looks like. Welcome to the game. Okay, once upon a time, you thought of a number between 0 and 10. Let me think. Uh, I, I always like the numbers... Uh, mm, I always like the number 3. Oops. Have you got one? Yes. Yes, I've got one. I think it's 5. Am I right? No. Uh, my number's 3, so that's lower. I'll hit L and enter. I think it's 2. Am I right? No. It's higher than that. I hit H. I think it's 3. Am I right? Yes. That was pretty good. Play again. No. Exit. Okay, so that's the game. Uh, this is the variable just here, difficulty. So if we change that up to something like that, you know, the computer's going to get pretty pretty good. Uh, got one? Yes. Okay, if it's three again, then we just say lower, lower, lower. 62,000 is going to take forever. Anyway, that's the game, and that's uh, just a basic introduction to um, yeah, the way a game loop works and the uh, basic structure to a game. Thank you for listening. See ya.